So today we'll be talking a little bit more about MongoDB and how it works and talk a little bit more about how to actually organize your data. Um, so like Shannon said, uh, MongoDB is a database system. It is a NoSQL uh, JSON-like database system. So when you think it, when you code in JavaScript, you normally hold your data in objects. And many programming, all, almost all programming languages have something like this. So it's just a object with field and some values. And this is a very natural way to think about data. And unlike SQL systems that force you to convert your structure into rows and columns or some other kind of thing, MongoDB just lets you keep all your logic uh, the same, just keep using objects and just act as if the objects are just normal, are, are just stored as is. So you want to use MongoDB uh, when you need when you don't have like a schema really defined early on. So you don't have to overwrite a lot of your code with like changes and stuff like that. You can just change the one place in your code. Uh, if you make a lot of writes to your database, so for example, in Catbook, you're going to be getting a lot of stories. MongoDB is very optimized to read writes sorry, to uh, perform writes. So it was especially good in, in like Facebook posts, adding comments or posting new data. Um, so when you make an Atlas account or when you start a MongoDB instance, you can think of this as like a warehouse that will store data about all your applications or anything that you wanna put inside. Uh, and this warehouse has, uh, rooms or containers, you know, sorry, just rooms or like a specific uh, instances of like databases. So you want to have a database for every single project that you have. So Catbook has a specific Catbook database. And inside this database, you get, there are boxes or collections. So MongoDB is a really organized machine. Uh, you inside every single like storage unit or database, it has smaller boxes and these are collections. And every, everything inside is just a collection. And inside these collections, there's something called the document. So when you open the box, there's a bunch of items. All the items are of the same type. So because you're a really organized person like me, inside every single container, you only have screws or you only have hammers or you only have whatever. And this is how you maintain your data nice and neat. And MongoDB stores data inside something called collections or a box. Inside this box, there's something called a document. A document is the object that you're trying to store. No way. So comments have their own document, stories have their own document. And inside the document, every single document has field and values. So for example, a screw will have a length a uh, thread, the type of screw head, whatever else you want to store about screws. So to reiterate, a MongoDB instance is um, a, the whole MongoDB program or the whole cluster that Atlas is allocating for you. A database is a part of the instance that will store data about your whole program. Inside the database, there's collections. These collections store a bunch of documents and all the documents should be of the same type. So screws, hammers, or like stories, comments. So every single collection will have just one type, but a bunch of them. Every single document is analogous to an object, and it has a bunch of field and fields and values. And this is more of a high level view. So there's a storage facility with a bunch of storage units that has a bunch of boxes inside, and each box has one specific thing. Uh, sorry, each box has a bunch of a specific type of thing. So shirts, screws, books, et cetera. And every single one of them has fields and values or information about the object. In MongoDB terminology, it's instance, database, collection, and document. I'll pause here for a little bit because I know it went a little bit fast. If there are any questions in the chat or just shout them out.
Is it okay? So that's how MongoDB is structured, structured but we're not gonna be directly interacting with uh, the MongoDB API. We're gonna use something called Mongoose and Mongoose allows you to talk to MongoDB in a very nice way. Mongoose is a library that you can install. You do npm install Mongoose and it's something called an object document mapping library. Th there's a bunch of, diff of different libraries that are built on top of database systems like type or, um, or Mongoose. It essentially allows you to create a instance of a class or it, it allows you to create an instance of a document that has much nicer methods. So instead of like post making a post request to MongoDB every single time that you wanna uh, add data to the database, you can just do something like dot save or dot load or something like that. It is basically a wrapper around the MongoDB API. Um, so Mongoose does a lot of things for you aside from just representing documents. It connects for the, to the cluster automatically for you. It will create the document, track changes, uh, delete documents. It could do whatever you want to do with MongoDB, but just in a very nice uh, way. So aside from all the, from just being nice to use, Mongoose also has one very important thing. Um, before that, does anyone have this drawer in your home where you just put everything because you just don't want to organize it or deal with it? It kind of looks like this or like this, or maybe even like this. Have you ever tried to find anything? I like, I'm very prone to losing stuff and I think I've lost like four phones to like this drawer or like seven USB cables and I always have to buy a new one. And this is how things get lost. And data is the same way. I did actually buy four phones. When I was in high school, I like gel broke phones and I used to like break them a lot. And like my dad, my parents got really mad at me, but it'd be like that. Yeah, so you can never find anything in this kind of drawer because it's very disorganized. And the same way MongoDB could become very disorganized. It doesn't actually guarantee, MongoDB doesn't actually enforce any of its rules. It's like a very lenient part. Uh, parent. It tells you what to do, but it doesn't actually ever check that you did it right. So if you have like a box that has like, uh, that has stories or sorry, a collection that has stories, you can add uh, comments to that same collection. It won't actually stop you. So the reason that this is really bad is because when you start your project, you have a clean instance and you become really good. You have like a lot of like, organization and you may always make sure that you always only add comments to the comments collection. But over time, it gets really hard to keep track of and just running code once that, mess, that doesn't have the right data will add a new object to the collection that shouldn't be there. And over time, as you keep making changes and changes and changes, a collection can become really disorganized. Uh -huh. And it will have one of everything. And at that point, it becomes basically useless because you'll query the comments collection, but you will get a story back and your code will not know how to deal with this. And you're either gonna have to do a lot of like checking and a lot of conversions or your code will just simply break. So to fix this, there's something called a schema. A schema is a computer science term used in many programming languages and database systems. So what a schema is, is merely a description of what the object should be. So schemas allow you to define, for example, the, uh, the name of the field and what type the field should be. Again, the type is things like strings, numbers, arrays, uh, booleans, whatever, whatever you want the type to be. So for example, right here, I have a, a, a new schema called where I stored my name, my age, and then the pets that I have as an array. So if I add this to MongoDB and I ran, and one time I used my, instead of doing an array, I just add a string for pets, MongoDB will not stop me and it will add it. And whenever I try to query the data and I act as if pets is an array, but in reality I put a string, my code will break. Oh, it will do some really weird things. JavaScript is really weird to like, it's, it's really hard to break because it allows you to do many things, but 
if you, you, you want your code to be correct, you want to make sure that the data is always clean. So Mongoose allows you to implement schemas, which are just the description of the type of object you will store inside. And each collection should have a schema when it's created, and it will enforce it whenever you make a change or whenever you're trying to add something. So in the previous example, if I try to add a new document to the database where my name, the pets field, uh, where the pets field was a string instead of an array, and it hit like save or something, it will actually not let me and tell me the pets field is mistyped. Please fix the pets field, and that's how I know my code is not correct. Okay, so there's many other types aside from the ones that I showed here. Uh, this is a very over a very oversimplified way to explain how a Mongoose and MongoDB works. In reality, there's a bunch of types and a bunch of like switches and knobs that you could like turn to really like make a very complex database that we won't cover. But most of the time, you're just going to define what type and what name the field should have. So now, we, that, now that we know that ske what schemas are, now we're going to move on into something called models. So note that schema is just a description of the, of the type of object that should be there. It just fields, uh, the name of the field, and the type that that field should have. And uh, it's not actually a, it's just this uh, one feature of the collection. Huh. Wait, the way you think of it is that many, many types of objects have the same schema. So for example, many uh, comments, maybe comments and like, I don't know, retweets have the same structure. And they will have like the same schema, but they're in reality different things in your head. And that's what models are for. Models, models take in a schema and allow you to construct documents and like get documents from the, from the collection, post new documents. In a way, when you create a model, you're essentially creating a collection in your database. Does that make sense? I'm going to stop for like 10 seconds. Uh, yeah, so the main difference between something like SQL and something like no and MongoDB is that you can change your schemas pretty, pretty easily. Um, all you have to do is go back to the file that you defined the schema in, add whatever changes you want to do, and Mongoose will automatically update your collection. Cool. So now I'll go into actual code and tell you guys how it works. So the first step to creating a collection is to define the schema. So if I want to add users to my database, I'll create a user schema. And Mongoose just has a schema uh, class, and I'll create a new instance of it. Now that I define the schema, I want to create a model. And the model will take in the name of the collection that you want to put, so in this case, user, and the schema that you want this collection to follow. And you can use Mongoose that model for this. And the user. Uh, variable right now represents the whole collection. Cool. So if you want to add a item to a document to your collection, you will take the model, create a new uh, instance of the class that the model has, and this will represent a, collect, a uh, document in the collection. And you use the new keyword for this. Um, and, it's, and you will initialize it with the data that you want the document to have in the constructor. And again, you will just have to do very simple methods like dot .safe, and, which returns a promise and writes the document to the, to the database. And right here, if I do tim.safe, it will talk to MongoDB, add it to my collection. If the collection had not, does not exist, it will create the collection for you, which is one of the key things that make it really is easy to use. And after that is uh, complete and it's successful, it will return whatever it will return whatever it wrote to the database, which should be this the same uh, an object that follows the same schema. And then you can return it to the front end or do something fancier with it, whatever you want to take. So altogether, uh, this is all the code that you need to actually set up a database. Are you going to be? Well, we wrote like half of the code for you. But just to uh, talk about how everything works. So in server.js, you don't have to open it. You'll see it in a bit. 
we just have to import the mongoose library, paste in the string that we got from uh, Atlas. Right here, the user is called user and the password is called password. This is fake, of course, but you will replace these two things right here with your actual username and password. Uh, database name, um, sometimes it's, it's included in the string, sometimes not. Uh, you don't really have to worry about options. Uh, these are just details that we abstract away and, and they're not too relevant. They're a little bit more advanced. So when you, so after you define all the fields, you do mongoose.connect and this will take your SRV string and then figure out which uh, instance of MongoDB you should talk to. And afterwards it will return a promise that says, and you can say something like connected or if it failed for some reason, Typically, it fails if the username and password are wrong. Uh, it will tell you why it failed. After you connect, uh, you can now create new, new schemas and new documents. Uh, so right here, I create a new user schema. Then I create a model with it. And then I create a new document using new and the name of the model or the instance of the model. And then you hit that save and add it to a collection in the database. So this is kind of like an end-to-end -end example of everything. Um, is there anything unclear so far? Because you guys are going to get to implement it in the next couple of steps. Again, there's the questions doc. If you guys want to like ask for more details about databases and stuff, and we'll be happy to answer. Oh, okay. Uh, model versus schema. So a schema just defines the data the data type or like the document. A model is actually a instance of a collection or it represents an instance of a collection. So you create a model using a schema and you give it a name. And when you create the model, it will actually go to MongoDB and create a new collection for you. While the schema is just one of the things that the model needs to figure out how to make the collection. Uh, why do you need user? Uh, the first par parameter over here inside model the reason that we need user in quotes is because user is just the name of the collection. Uh, Mongoose lets you or it requires you to choose a name for the collection uh, that you want, and it will automatically uh, create a collection for you. Uh, and yes, you can have user models. Okay, so after you run this code over here and you hit that save, if it works correctly, you can go to Atlas. And Mongoose did a bunch of things for you already. It created a database called it created a database called Test. However, the database had already been created for you. If it wasn't there, it would create it for you. Uh, then it created, it created a collection called Users. Note that I put user in capital letter and just in singular. And it somehow made it into a plural lowercase form. Mongoose does this for you, and it's just because semantically it's easier to think about uh, collections as being a bunch of something. So a better name for it is users versus just user. And if we, up, if we open up the collection, there's the pets, the name, and the age. You don't have to worry about underscore underscore v. Uh, that's just the version of the model that you have. Um, it's just something that Mongoose needs to work. And it created uh, something else. It created something called an ID. So before we actually had to create the ID, we did like ID is equal to zero or ID is equal to one, but you don't need to do that. Um, so MongoDB uses this concept of an object ID. An object ID is a string that represents uh, a unique identifier for that document. The ID field is huge, and it's very unlikely that you will ever have two documents that have the same ID. It's like one in a trillion chance of having a collision. And that's just because of the way that an object ID is made. Uh, it's always assigned as underscore ID. If you go to MongoDB, you can tweak some things and change what you use as the identifier. But for the most part, you want to stick to the one that's automatically generated for you. And the reason that we need an ID aside from identifying is because it's, it allows you to describe relationships between documents. So for example, in the comments uh, collection, we wanna have something called, we wanna have like uh, a document that contains a parent ID. 
that represents the ID of the story that this comment should have. And this is how you represent relationships, even though the documents are just, there's no like hard and fast, there's no like direct relationship in the code, but if you use IDs and you link IDs to each other, that's how you define relationships. Um, okay, so that's creating documents and connecting to the database. Now I'm gonna go into actually finding and deleting data from your database. So Mongoose, Mongoose, has, Mongoose has a method called find. This method takes in an object where you can put fields and values and it will return any document in the collection that has the same fields and values. So for instance, right here, I do user.find and an empty object. Uh, the empty object has no fields and values. So it means that it will return all the documents that exist in the database because there's no like requirements as to which document we exactly want. It's called a query and there's a MongoDB query language that you could look up online and it can do very fancy stuff like finding documents that like have some geographic relationship to each other. There's a bunch of things MongoDB offers, but for the most part, you're gonna wanna do just a uh, find and the fields and values that the object should have. So how this looks like is, for example, if I wanna have all the users, no, all the users named Tim, I could just put name, name colon Tim, and it will return all the users named Tim. If I wanna add more fields, I could do Tim and the age, and it will return all the users that fulfill both of those, uh, that have both of those field, fields. Um, cool. To delete document, uh, you wanna do, you wanna use delete one and the type and the fields and values that the document that you wanna delete has. Uh, normally you will use the ID to make sure that you're deleting the correct document because MongoDB makes no, uh, no assertions or no promises as to which document you will, it will delete. Uh, it will just delete whichever one has names equal to Tim or whichever one fulfills the query that you put inside the method. Uh, there's a very dangerous method called delete many. Delete many deletes all documents that match the query. You wanna be really careful with this one. If you're using delete many, you probably should not be using delete many. Uh, there is very specific cases that you wanna use delete many. It's like when a story, let's say for when a story gets deleted and you wanna delete all the comments of the story, maybe that's the correct usage, but be really careful with this because it will actually delete the whole data, delete a bunch of documents and there's getting them back is really hard. And I don't think you can if you're using a free MongoDB instance. I once deleted a bunch of like documents from a year up because I used delete many instead of delete one. So be real careful with this one. Um, okay, so, so far we've seen a bunch of Mongoose code and the way that the Mongoose is set up in our server is that we have a file called api.js which handles queries. It will take the user model and fulfill those queries using the user model or whatever model you wanna use. And the user model takes in a schema and it has, it has a couple more methods to interact with the collection. And whenever you, you're using methods like find, delete, or like uh, save, it will talk to MongoDB in the background for you and it will return a promise. Uh, there's many other parameters that you can use like in, Mongo, in Mongoose and validation and much other things that are very like useful. And you can look this up in this link when you have your own time. All right, so we'll actually be moving on to the workshop soon. So I'll stop here for questions. Uh, yeah, so you don't wanna delete documents by accident in internship. Um, I don't know if you'll get a return offer, but let's hope you do. So yeah, so the, the reason that I deleted everything from my year up is because I actually wasn't using Mongoose. I was just using the, the, the vanilla MongoDB API and that that's, and there's a method called delete and I thought it deleted just one, but no, it deletes everything. Don't do that. Okay, so for the workshop, we're gonna do a couple things. 
we're going to create new schemas and new models, um, connect them with api.js, and then hook that to MongoDB so we can actually save all the stories and comments we have. Um, so I created this nice little cheat sheet in weblab.2 slash Mongo snippets. So you don't have to go back to the slides and figure out how to create and delete documents. I will just keep this handy when I let you guys on your own to implement something. Okay, so the first step is actually connecting MongoDB, MongoDB and Mongoose. So I'll have you guys do a git fetch, a git reset hard, and check out to workshop six starter. I'll give you guys like 20 seconds. So now you want to take out the Mongo SRV that you guys hopefully uh, already have from, from the setup guide. It will look kind of like this. It says Mongo plus SRV. And right here, there's two things, the username and the password. And you want to replace these things right here with your actual username and password. MongoDB doesn't know them because if they know the password, there's some really weird security happening in the background. You don't want this. Okay, so you take the, that SRV and you want to go into server.js and there's a variable called Mongo connection URL and you want to replace this with your SRV. Right now, I think it's an empty string. Uh, so I'll do this with you guys. So you want to go into server.js. Right here, it's an empty string. You want to Want to go here, paste that, save it, and you want to do npm start. And it will say something like connected to MongoDB. If you need help setting up uh, MongoDB or need don't know where your SRV string is, uh, go to the help queue and someone from staff will help you. Can you guys do like, I don't know, a thumbs up reaction or some reaction in the chat when you guys have this working? I'll give you guys like another 30 seconds. Um, the, the DB name part um, is the name of the database that you created. Um, yeah. So you want to go to like cloud that MongoDB. Uh, the, the SRV is already in the public Git cat book. I don't think we have to like set it. Yeah, you never want to share your SRV. Um, normally, you will put this inside a something called an end file, which is a file you only have locally that contains all your credentials and all stuff that should not be public. Um, you do not want to commit this file to GitHub because our the GitHubs we set up for you are public. So anyone that opens your GitHub and has your SRV will be able to do anything with your database, essentially. Okay, so you should hit clear, create new cluster. Once you create a cluster, 
you want to do connect, uh, connect with your application, it will give you something like this. You want to copy it and you want to replace the fields over here, uh, DB with the database name. In this case, it's black swan. Uh, and then the username and password are set up here. So for example, this is the database for Buka Buka. Oh uh, yeah. This is the database for Buka Buka and I have a user called Buka Buka. And that's, and the password I set up like uh, when I created the user and MongoDB has no idea what it is. So I have to just remember that. And then once you have that string, you wanna put it here in line 29 of uh, server.js. The database should not have a space, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Does it work with a space? I don't Wait, think so. Wait, click into Black Swan. Just click into it. Um, and you click collections. Mm -hmm. MongoDB is a little bit slow sometimes. The database name, I believe, is the same thing as the name of your cluster. No. Yeah, so you have three databases in here. Buka Buka, Ignite, and Black Swan. Yeah. yeah. As a fun fact, all the Buka Buka does is to keep track of your question and its happiness. You guys have asked 330 questions today, which is kind of impressive. I'm really impressed by this. Okay, so the way that you figure out how it's working is if you do npm start and you receive the following message. If you if this does not work, or like you put the wrong thing, if you do npm start, it will just give you unable to parse string or something like wrong username and password, some error message. Okay, again, uh, if you need help, uh, go to the queue and you guys can go to the, the breakout rooms and some someone will staff will help you set this up. Uh, okay, so I'll be moving on to let's talk. Okay, I'll be moving on to the next slide. Again, it should look something like this. Uh, I don't think this one works anymore. So now we're gonna actually create models and schemas. And we wanna create models and schemas for comments and stories because those are the two things we wanna store in our database. So in Shannon's lecture, you guys saw this diagram. And we're gonna have a database for a cat book, uh, two collections, one for stories and one for comments. And each of these collections will have a bunch of documents. And each document will have the fields and values of the comments and stories respectively. So um, if you open the models directory and open story.js, this is where we're gonna create the model for stories. And there's the story will have of three things, the creator ID, the creator name, and the content. And we want each of these to have the type string. And like we said before, the way to ensure that every single document in the collection follows this, uh, this schema is by defining a new schema. So I'll actually do this for you. Uh, so if we go to models, we'll have an empty file right here. And to define it, we want to do some. We want to import mongoose. I'll just do this with you. You guys don't have to follow. You guys can follow along, but uh, you guys will check out to the next step where this is already defined for you. Uh, in this workshop, I will do basically anything related to stories, and you guys will implement the comments part. So you want to import mongoose, and afterwards, let's say I want to create a story schema. You want to do 
let's see, what do we need? We needed to create a new object. We wanted to create a new and we wanted the actual content. So once we have the schema, we want to create the model. Now this is okay. So as you can see, like Mongo's code or like Mongo is actually not uh, too complex to actually use. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you just create a schema, then you create a model, and then now that this will actually create a collection for you. So again, what we did was create a new schema and we created a model with it. Okay, so I'll let you guys uh, try to create a comet model for uh, five minutes or so, or three minutes. Uh, just It will look very similar to how I created the stories. And you want to do it in the comments file in the stories folder. And all the, the fields are here and they all should be of type string. Uh, yeah, I can go back to the code. So this is the story code. Uh, actually, we don't need creator ID. Uh, we, we just need creator name. Uh, creator ID will be a better way of identifying who created it, but we could also just use creator name. Um, yeah, one uh, um, one field in the in the comments model, or sorry, in the comments schema, will be parent. Uh, you could also do parent ID. Um, we just to make it look a little bit nicer, we use parent. But what it will store is the ID of the parent, the, of the parent story that it comes from. No, actually, put this half of this here and half of this here. Okay. Um, if you're done, you could just do like, I don't know, some kind of reaction or something.
Okay, I see like maybe 50% of people are done. We'll give you guys another two, three minutes. Again, there's always the help queue and the question stock. Again, just to emphasize again, if you go to wablab slash mongos, mongo snippets, uh, there's a cheat sheet where you can read about all the things you can do with mongoose and reference code that you'll probably need to be writing. I'll start writing some of the code for, um, for this code, for comments. So again, we want to import mongoose. And then we want to do in the comment schema. Here you put the fields that you want. And if you do that, I'm going to do Like this. Uh, parent is a string uh, because uh, it represents an ID. An ID we used as a number in the previous workshops, but MongoDB actually doesn't use numbers for IDs. MongoDB uses something called an object ID. An object ID is in an ID that has a very specific structure. And having an ID that has a very specific structure lets the people at MongoDB uh, do very fancy things, which makes retrieval way faster than just uh, using numbers. And in reality, we should actually not use string. We should use something like mongoose that types that object ID. But an object ID is also, takes, also can be a string. Um, so just for simplicity, you can write as a string. Uh, let me check the help queue. Okay, it looks like that everyone in the help queue is being helped. So I'm going on to the next step. So the mo your model should look something like this. Uh, three fields, creator name, parent content, all string. The parent is the ID of the parent story, and that's how we represent the relationships. And then we create a model with a schema and export it. Okay, so now that we have a, the model set up, we want to actually connect our API. Uh, and instead of just using uh, a variable that we hard-coded in the last two workshops, we want to actually talk to MongoDB. So you're going to have to do uh, get research hard, uh, get checkout workshop step one. And again, you want to go to server.js line 20, I think it's 21 or 27. And 
take the SRV that you had in the previous step and put it there. I'll give you guys like 20 seconds to do this. Wanna go and take the survey that you had before. Uh, I forgot to delete it. If you're stuck and you really can't get MongoDB working, here's the one we use in Catbook. So we want to. What we want to do in this step is import the models from uh, the models file that we created, and then use it in our API. So within API.js, if you open it, you're going to see a line called something like this. Uh, we use require in the back end to import things from other files, um, unlike in the front end, which we and where we have a little bit of a different syntax. And you want to import. And what this line does is it takes the model that I exported in the story file. So if we open story.js, this was the export, and it imports it into API.js. So if you open API.js, you will have a line like this. And so if you want to import the comment model, we will do something like same thing, basically. I'll let you guys uh, 10 seconds or so to like import the comment, but it should look something like this. So now we're going to be migrating the endpoints that we created in the previous workshops and use them and connect MongoDB, MongoDB to them. That way we actually write to the database. So right now we're going to implement uh, get stories. So to implement get stories, what we did before was go into a variable and then look up all the stories and just return all the objects inside that, that array. In MongoDB, it'll be slightly different. We don't want to just return we want to actually make a query to the database. And the way that we do this is by using the find method, which is defined in the cheat sheet somewhere. Uh, again, we want to use the find method that's over here. So the find method is the model is the first argument, then that find and the query you want to do, and it will return a promise that has the that will return all the documents that match the query. So we already have the, the comment model already imported. And to get all the stories, we will just use something like find an empty query. So the reason that we need an empty query again is you want to get every single one of them. If I want to, for example, return only stories that have the word hello in their content, or that have uh, or maybe all the stories that are created by me, We'll do something like this. But right now, we just want to return all the stories. So we do that then. Again, a promise is something that runs after some async code or something that like gets called whenever some async code is finished running. And it will return a lit an array containing documents. And we just want to send that back to the server. So the code will look kind of like this. Um, 
I'll give you guys like 10 seconds to copy the code or 10 to 20 seconds uh, here in the slides. Okay. So now we're gonna want you, we want to write the post endpoint. So in post, we created a new story based on the parameters that we got from the front end. So a little bit of a oh, side note here. Um, this has been emphasized in a couple of previous workshops, but just to reiterate again, get request and post request store data in different places. Um, in the get request, rec that query contains all the data that the front end sent. So all the parameters. So if you wanna, however, in the post request, everything that gets stored in the body field inside the request. So for example, if you wanted to access the content uh, field that got sent by the front end in a get request, you will do rec that query that content. If you want to get it from a post request though, it's rec.body.content. And okay, so I'll implement the post request for uh, stories and you guys will implement the post and get request for comments in the next step. But for now, so right now we actually have no idea um, what the creator name is because the front end is not sending it. So we just want to hard code it for now. Uh -huh. So we want to do something like my name equal to and so the way that you create a new document in a database is by doing uh, the new operator by using new and the name of the model that you're uh, creating. Is equal to new story. And let's see, what did story need? So story needed two fields, creator name and content. So creator name dot body. Oh wait, so creator, we don't have a creator name right now. So we'll just hard code it. After we create uh, the document, we want to tell our database to save this. So do that save and do that done. And the promise will return the document that you created. And we just want to send that back to our front end. We use that plus that send story. Okay, I'll check the chat to see if there are any questions so far. Okay. So note how one design thing that we want to make sure right here is that we only ever want to return return when we know that the operation worked. So some very bad practice will be to do something like uh, return. Send the story and before we actually save it. If we do this, uh, Express will respond to the request and then it'll save. However, if save fails for some reason, the, the front end will never know because it already got a 200 status code back and it thinks it worked. So when writing code, be sure that you only send back to the front end whenever you're sure that the operation was correct. So that's why we need the safe operation to happen before the send, the, before we return anything to the server. Okay. Uh, 
So plus three kind of looks like this, like the code I just showed. Uh, you can check out to step two. Uh, again, copy, maintain the SRV that you kept in the previous step. You don't, you don't ever want to commit to GitHub and go back to server.js and replace the line with your actual SRV. All right, so now we'll implement the get request for comments. Uh, this one will be on your own. Uh, so you can hop into the help queue if you need help about how to implement this or reference the cheat sheet that's at wablab.2 slash mongo dash snippets. It will look kind of like this. And you could also find this cheat sheet if you go to wablab.mit.edu slash resources and there's a cheat sheet subsection inside that page. So you want to, uh, for this step, we're going to implement the get comment uh, endpoint. Again, what we want to do right here is re not return all the comments, but just return the comments about a specific story. So you're going to need to know the parent. And the front end sends the parent in rec that query. So you will probably have to use this. And most of the code is already written for you. That's right here. Note that right here, it will not be an empty query because an empty query will return all the comments and we want to return all just the comments that are relevant to a specific story. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll give you guys like three, five minutes or something. Check the question stock, see what how it's doing. Uh, yes, you can use any variable instead of students right here. What the fuck? Did I get a crash? Did we lose Johan? Oh, he's back. Now nah, we're back. Uh, one second, though. Let me know when you can see your screen, my screen. And we're good. Cool. Yeah, so you can use any variable right here um, as, the fun as the name. Uh, it's good. It's good coding practice to have variable names that make sense. If you write something like 
this and then return this. Code will work, but whoever tries to change this code will be really confused. Uh, generally, we try to make sure that the names make sense. Um, okay. I'll be moving on a little bit. Um, again, go into the help queue or ask questions in the question stock if you have if you need help. Um, so right here, um, we don't want to do an empty query. We want to query only specific documents. So again, if we go into the comment model and the comment schema, we can see the comments have a field called parent. And the parent represents the ID of the story that this comment should be below. So if we do parents equal to rec .query .parent, uh, it will return only the comments that are that have the parent field set to the ID of the story that this belongs to. Again, we use query because it's a get request, not a post request, and all the data that we put inside the request is stored in the query. And the solution should look kind of like this. Okay, so after we implement the get, the get request, we also want to implement the post request. The post request will look very similar to the post request we had for stories, but just that it will have different fields. And again, go to, so we want to implement a post request for a comment. We want to extract uh, the ID of the story that it comes from. Uh, put the creator name of the comment and the content of the comment. Those are the three fields that we want to store. Uh, so I'll give you guys a, a little bit more time to implement this one. Just use the how implemented new story as a uh, guide to have uh, as a guide to implement the other post endpoint. Um, rec is a variable name we use to that's we use that represents the whole um, data that the front end sent. Uh, traditionally, it's always called rec. It stands for request, and this is where you're going to retrieve all data that the request has, essentially. I like how I don't use them. I just use Buka Buka as a question doc. I should probably actually check the question stock. Uh, the creator name should also be hard coded, by the way, because right now we don't actually have the name of the user that made the request. We'll implement names and authentication in. Uh, on Monday, and we'll do fancy yourself like uh, actually display your name in the front end, stuff like that. Right now, there's not. Uh, if you want to actually check that your database is working, uh, you could just do npm start. Okay. 
And right now I haven't implemented comments, so only stories will work. And you can go into 2000. Blah, cat book. You can see something like time. I don't know what is this madness. Can I type or something? What the? Comment is not to find out. Yeah, JavaScript lets you like run code without it actually being valid code, which I find really annoying. Next week, you're going to learn something called TypeScript, and which prevents errors like this from happening. It's much, much nicer than JavaScript. I love it. Right now, this semester, the next semester, we're teaching 6031 using TypeScript. Uh, so I would recommend that one instead of just Java. It's a great time. Uh, did I forget NPM and so? I not find modules much for this. It's weird. And right here, Ben Bitditto appears because that's my name in line 15. OK, so I'll walk a little bit through the code. Uh, let me just check the chat first. Dude, job. It, it should be npm start. And also, Java is much worse than TypeScript. TypeScript is much nicer, much worse nicer. Uh, and generally, yes, MongoDB is specialized to handle data. Uh, you could run a MongoDB instance inside Heroku, but that is cursed. Do not try it because Heroku is not meant to be a database, or it is not like optimized to be a MongoDB instance. And it will probably crash if you get many users. Uh, so I will just avoid using uh, servers for things that they were not meant for. Uh, let's see. So we want to create a new comment. And the new comment will use the data from the front end. So. And the creator name. Your name comes from it's hard coded for now. Parent it is stored in rec the body that parent, and the content is stored in rec the body that content. So just a little advice. Um, most of the time when you are writing code for your web app, the bugs many bugs will come from. The, ser the server not being able to load data from the back end or the front end not sending the correct data. You want to make sure to have really good documentation. And I know that body that parent is not undefined or that the front end actually fills something in this field. Uh, however, JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript will not actually enforce this. So if I did something like write that parent that uh, Parent underscore name. It will run. This will be undefined. And either I believe Mongoose will actually Mongoose will let it slide because undefined is just a string that has not been initialized. Uh, but you will get weird bugs. So either put it as a comment or make a Google Doc that you define all the endpoints that we make sure that the correct data is being sent. Again, TypeScript does this for you. Next week. Okay. We want to save it. This actually saves, saves it to the database. Wanna, and then it will return the comment that it saved. And then you want to send it back to the front end. Okay. And this is kind of how it will look. Um, actually, fun question for the class. 
uh, what will happen if I do something like this? Will it run? Will it save? Will it fail to save? Will it save three to the database? Uh, or will it just throw some weird runtime error? Uh, actually, let's find out. Let's see. So, if you go, actually, let me do it for uh, stories since I know that stories worked. So it saved it. It didn't throw any errors here. And it also didn't throw any errors in the front end. But what actually happened was that when I created the story, yeah, it returns something. Uh, this seems like an error, an unrelated error. I'll ignore it. But if we look at what it saved, it actually saved. See, so this is what Mongoose guarantees. It guarantees that even if your code got messed up and you wrote a variable that shouldn't have been there inside when you initialize the document, the database stays uh, consistent. So even though I added upvotes as the, inside the constructor, Mongoose knows that the schema does not allow for upvotes. So it will not actually commit it to the database and the data, that way, even though your code might be right, might might not follow the schema, the database will always follow the schema, and this will prevent your database from ever getting really screwed up. And and if it gets really screwed up, you're gonna have to do some things you don't want, like going through the whole database and deleting any object that does not follow the schema, nuking the whole database, or just closing the project and never opening it again. So let's take, let's avoid that. So this is how a post comment should look, and this is what I wrote over here, more or less. Uh, the creator name is hard coded. Rect body contains the parent and the content, so we initialize it that way. And new comment that save is a promise that returns the comment that was saved to MongoDB, and we want to send that back to the front end. Uh, so you want to do npm start npm run hot loader that way you can check. Uh, if it works. And right now you should be able to post a story and post a comment about a story. And now even if you reload the page and restart your server, nothing will be lost. So let's see. Yes. This line. Whatever. It's fine. So even though I restarted the server, once I reload it, all my testing data is still there. Um, again, uh, it's very important for this, the SRV uh, string not to be public. We make it public because we wanna make sure that you guys have a working uh, cat book on your end, even before you know what MongoDB is or before you know anything about how databases work. In an actual project, uh, you will want to make the string a secret. 
a secret is a concept that uh, is very like popular inside like uh, things like GitHub and like uh, DevOps kind of apps. So the way that you do a secret is that you make a file called that env. At that env file, you will write something like Mongo SRV. If I can type. And you want to copy this. Cut it. Uh, go to the end file. Type it here. Save it. There's a file called dot git ignore. That git ignore is a file uh, that GitHub uses to know which files never to commit to GitHub. So right now in the git ignore file, we have client that this client this bundle.js. Uh, this one, this means that the code that gets compiled on your end. So this huge file right here that contains all the code for, for the front end never gets committed to GitHub because we don't want it. Uh, and it also says that we you should never commit not modules. This is an error that, this is a mistake that someone, that everyone will do at one point or that ah! most people have done at some point. You commit a huge folder that has thousands and thousands of files. And this will like make your GitHub like very sad. So you want to add that to the git ignore, and you also want to add the dot env file to the git ignore. If we go and do git status, check that the only file that it says that it will commit is the dot git ignore file. It will never not commit the dot env file. If I remove this from here, and do git status, it will commit the dot env file, and we don't want that. So after you define the variable inside your end file, you want to go into server. You want to do, uh, there's a library, a library called .env. This is a library that runs, that loads all the environment variables and allows you to use them in your code. You process that env dot mongo SRV. I wouldn't bother with this installing because it takes like a minute. But oh yeah, so the dot dot git ignore file is a is a file that GitHub uses to know which files to never commit to GitHub, or in other words, ignore. You want you want to put uh, it will take in the names of the files that to ignore in every single new line. So right here, it's ignoring the bundle.js file, which gets which gets made by Webpack. And the node modules file, which is the folder with all your dependencies, and the .env file. The .env file will store every every single secret. A secret is something that you don't want um, people to know. So credentials, passwords, usernames, um, a special config variables. This is used when you actually deploy your code. I think this one will cover this again. But things like the Mongo SRV uh, do not follow our example where we just put it in the code because someone will be able to read this, will have access to your database, delete it, change the schema, do anything with it. So at that end file allows you to have some security that all the keys will never be public. And the way that you use a dot end file is by using a library called dot env and then calling dot config and then using process.env.mongo.srv. Now if I do npm start, hopefully it won't fail. Uh, I'm gonna check the question stock. Yeah, so it says connected to MongoDB even though I actually never typed it. it just, I just typed it in the end file. I 
Again, if your code isn't working for some reason, you can check out to workshop six complete. Um, this will have the SRV that we use in for Catbook. You can replace it with your own. And actually, if you go to like, if you go to your uh, Atlas account, you will see that you'll have a new collection here. And then uh, and inside the collection, you'll have your stories. Uh, let me make this bigger for you guys. Yeah. So if you go to Atlas, it will look something kind of like this. Um, M files are not included in the cheat sheet, I believe. Yeah, so if you go to the full, uh, your database instance, or sorry, your MongoDB instance, you'll see a new database called Catbook or whatever name you gave it. Uh, two collections, one called comments, one called stories. And every single one of those fields will have all the stories and comments that you, um, that your Catbook has um, had. Uh, you need to you need to run npm install.env because it's a library to load environmental variables. Uh, this specific branch does not have that dependency, but you do, do need to run npm install.env if you want to use environment variables. As a recap, today we learned how databases are structured, more specifically MongoDB, how to connect to it from your backend, how to interact with the database via an API and Mongoose, and how the front end will actually will interact with the back end. And that's about all you need to know about MongoDB. Um, of course, you can come to office hours if you want to know a mo more fancier things that MongoDB could do. Uh, but just for reference, uh, you can look up the MongoDB documentation, the MongoDB documentation, uh, if you want to do anything fancier than just retrieving documents that follow some fields and values. And yeah, so it's Friday, so you guys can leave. Uh, there's nothing after this. Uh, Shannon or Nick, if you guys have any announcements to make, um, feel free to shout them out. I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, yeah, you can see the server code. Let me reshare my screen. Uh, here. So you don't need this stuff. Uh, this one's just me, just uh, telling you guys how to do more things since I have extra time. Uh, oh, that's out of everything. Uh, you want to, this is using the ver environmental variable instead of just a string. And you have to use the .env library for this. And we got it to the .env file. And this is where the, your actual SRV is at. I'll leave the question stock open to see if you guys have any more questions. Also, if you guys want Puka Puka to do fancier things, post on Piazza. I, I, I need to do something with my life over, over winter break. Mm. Oh. Oh, also, uh, one thing. So sometimes you will get um, this error. So when you run the hot loader, it uses port 5000. If you try to run the hot loader again, it will fail, I believe, because it's also trying to use port 5000. And only one program can ever listen to the same port, I believe. So when it tries to, when two, two different programs or two different instances of a program try to run and listen to the same port, uh, they will fail. Uh, this is compiled, but it's not being served. Weird. My code just that good, I guess. Uh, well, anyways, if you ever get some weird error that says something like address is being used or error address is used, you can run this command. This one's a dangerous one, but this is how I fix it. So pkill is a command line tool on Windows and Linux to kill programs. And if you click this, it will kill anything that uses node.js. Um, as a side note, 
VS Code actually does use some dependencies on Node.js. So when I run this, it will actually kill uh, VS Code. And this is, I have to do this sometimes, but after a little bit, it works. Um, and this will like release all ports that are currently being used. That way you can restart your program and actually listen to a port. And the most common way that this happens is by you clicking, but just by you just closing terminal. So if you do like, instead of hitting control C, uh, if you just click like the X button, it will not guarantee that the port is freed. So if I do like NPM start and then just close it, port 3000 might be stuck. And when you do, when you do NPM start and no other terminal windows are open, it will still be blocked. Um, okay, so that's it for code. Uh, remember the milestone one is due by midnight today. Uh, milestone one, you just need to sign up for a slot. Uh, we'll be doing, uh, we'll be talking to your teams all the weekend, through the whole weekend. And by the time we go, to, you guys meet with us, have some wireframes or some, some wireframes and be able to walk me through uh, what your site is.